here in Austin, uh, as Barry mentioned, I'm from Minneapolis, and while I happen to love wintertime there, the 40 degree difference here uh, definitely is a nice reprieve. So thank you for having me. Unless that goes. So, uh, I'm an engineer at HashiCorp, as Mary mentioned. Uh, it's a company that specializes in cloud infrastructure automation. Uh, we build a suite of open source tools such as Terraform, Vault, Vagrant, Console, and a bunch of others. Uh, come say hi to me afterward, especially if you're a fan of our tools, because I happen to have a bunch of HashiCorp stickers, if HashiCorp stickers are your thing. So before I started HashiCorp, I worked at Red Hat, uh, where one of my tasks was leading the design of a new API. And for this new API, we decided to try uh, a new technology called GraphQL. Now, when you look on internet forums or orange-themed websites, you might see a lot of people who take a split second glancing at GraphQL, and they're like, oh my goodness, we need to rewrite everything in GraphQL. Well. If you're like me, uh, you aren't some starry-eyed person who will adopt a technology just because it's the hip new thing. You've got to have a good reason for it. But you probably noted that a lot of companies are starting to adopt GraphQL. Now, as tech leads, lead developers, senior engineers, engineering managers, even CTOs or VPs here today, you should be aware of what all the hype is about and whether or not you should even bother looking to see if the tool is the right job for your uh, organization. So it begs to ask the question, why? What problem is this technology solving? I'm going to spend the next nine minutes or so giving you a small taste of GraphQL to enable you to seek out more information and kind of kickstart your research and figuring out whether or not GraphQL makes sense for your team to use. Uh, so to start this off, we'll look at the GitHub GraphQL API. And I'm using this example not only because it's a really great example uh, of a GraphQL API, uh, but because uh, well, it's a really good example of an API. <laughs> so we're going to look at this first request. Uh, it is going to fetch the currently authenticated user. And this is in REST. We're going to take a look at REST and then uh, see how that compares to GraphQL. When we make our request, we get back a response that looks just like this. And this is basically all the different properties of a user. Now, the important thing to note here is that REST APIs return resources. I have to say one thing. My monitor isn't working down here at all, actually. Sorry. <laughs> so anyway, we can get that fixed. I'm super sorry about that. It's just frozen on one screen. Talk amongst yourselves, folks. Sorry about that, folks. Tell us an interesting Minnesota fact. <laughs> one of the wrestlers in the previous talk was from Minnesota. Do you know which one? Brock Lesnar. Was Ric Flair from Minnesota too? I think you're right, actually. This is great. I should give a talk where I just take in all the different facts about, about Minnesota and whatnot. All right. You good? Let's try that. OK, we're back. So sorry about that. Woo! Thank you. So throughout this talk that might be a little longer, I'm going to use GitHub as a great example of an API. And I'm using GitHub not only because it's a great API, but it deals with a lot of information that's applicable to a lot of technologists here. So with the REST API, you have an HTTP verb and an endpoint. And this combination specifies which part of the API we'd like to interact with, as well as what sort of action we'd like to take. So this request, for example, is requesting for information about the currently authenticated user. Now, when we make the request, we get back a response in JSON format that looks a lot like this. And it has all sorts of information that's specific about the user that I'm asking about. Now, the most important thing to note here is that REST APIs return resources. And resources describe entire objects in our domain space. And you usually use things like hypermedia to get back machine-readable links to other resources to get all the information for whatever it is that you're trying to do. So as an application utilizing a REST API, you can see that we might have to make multiple requests to get everything that we need. And this is less than ideal, especially for mobile clients who might be trying to do all this on limited bandwidth, like on a 2G connection or something. Which brings us to GraphQL. So GraphQL is a query language specification. And there are multiple implementations of this specification in JavaScript, Ruby, Scala, all the popular languages. It's a language that you send over HTTP in a post request body, but largely replaces REST functionality past that point. 
So whereas REST APIs return entire resources, GraphQL returns exactly what clients need and nothing more across different related resources. So let's take a look at a GraphQL query. The first thing that we note is this viewer. And this viewer object represents the currently authenticated user from our REST example. We can see that the user object provides us a name, email, repositories, and these are called fields. Now, fields can be scalar values like strings or integers, or they can be other objects that yield their own set of fields. In this case, I'm asking for each of the user's repositories, give me the full name of the repo as well as the repo's description. When we execute this query against the server, we get back a response that looks like this. Now, this demonstrates the usual explanation of GraphQL, that you can fetch multiple resources at once. But more than that, you should note that the response that we get back mirrors the shape of the request that we made. And that's a really important part about GraphQL. The client actually dictates the shape of the response that the server returns. That is to say that GraphQL is very client-centric. And you can see that in many other ways. And here's one more quick example. Say we wanted to find information about two very specific people, their name, their company, and their location. Now, you might expect that what we get back looks like this. And while it's technically and regrettably valid JSON, duplicate keys are almost universally frowned upon, that idea. So GraphQL allows us uh, to dictate how the server should differentiate different resources in the same data set by using aliases. The client can specify what it wants the key of each user to be. And while this is only a single little example, one of many, it maybe doesn't even make sense out of context, it's a tiny demonstration of the client-centric nature of the language. GraphQL is typed. A GraphQL API is backed by a schema that specifies what fields should exist on each strongly typed object, what object you can expect to be returned from calling field, as well as other bits of information like which fields guarantee to return a non-null value. So you might be thinking type. That's cool, I guess. Types are hip again. That's great. <laughs> GraphQ I'm a Ruby developer. GraphQL is typed, which means that GraphQL is introspective. It can tell you about what it can do and its capabilities through its metadata. And one such tool that has been built with the metadata returned from GraphQL's type schema is Graphical, which is this browser-based IDE that allows you to write GraphQL queries on the left side and see the result of that query on the right. So as I'm typing on the left side, I actually get an auto-completed list of all the different types, all the different options and arguments to fields. Uh, enumerables, all the different parts of the API. So say I wanted to find uh, the total number of closed issues on the Terraform repository. I can do that by writing a query like this. State closed. And I'll look for the total count. Now, when I fire that off, I get back a response exactly how I would expect. It looks like there's about 10,000 resolved issues in the Terraform repository. That's pretty cool. Now, what happens if I misspell something? I say stays instead of states. Instead of the API just saying, hey, you made a malformed response, I can actually get feedback saying, hey, this isn't right. This is exactly where it's wrong in the line and column number. Maybe you should do something about that. That's awesome. That's great. I can also mouse over parts of my query and see all the different type signatures and click on different fields and types and have a full documentation explorer describing the entire schema and all that's encompassing it. That is pretty awesome. It's also completely searchable. That is some powerful stuff to be able to craft the exact, exact query that you want. That's pretty much to say that documentation is basically free. The introspective capabilities of the type system allow GraphQL APIs to generate documentation about themselves. And this example up here is of a Ruby project called GraphQL Docs. Uh, it's written by a former GitHubber. And it builds markup of your API schema. It's actually the thing that GitHub uses for its static documentation, if I'm not mistaken. But there's plenty of GitHubbers around that can tell me that I'm wrong if that's the case. Similarly, another project in RubyLand, this one uh, is written by a current GitHubber, exists to compare the difference between two schemas and output that in a meaningful way in the form of a change log. Instead of hard semantic versions and manual documentation, GraphQL APIs evolve over time, and the instrumentation to document that is a really huge advancement. Which brings me to the last thing that I'll talk about today, and my personal favorite, is that deprecations are built in. If I go back to my uh, graphical explorer here, Say I wanted to look up the first 10 members of an organization on GitHub. 
I can go ahead and do that like this. I can use the members field and ask for the first 10. And say I wanted to get their name and maybe their login, their username on GitHub. When I fire off the query, I get back exactly what I expect. But something is a little different. If we look at members, we can actually see that it's marked as deprecated. GitHub actually has marked this for removal and warns you through the API metadata. You'll see that members is going to be removed. They're going to suggest a different field, and they're going to tell you exactly when on UTC, UTC time uh, when that field is going to be removed. That is really powerful stuff. So although you can do that in REST, the fact that it's conventionalized in a specification in GraphQL is very powerful. They allow APIs to be changed organically over time. And GraphQL APIs are actually versionless, but that's a topic that you'll have to go learn more about yourself. So I've only scratched the surface of GraphQL in this 10-minute talk, and there are a ton of other things to talk about, mutations, front-end specifications like Relay or Apollo, if you've heard of those, uh, server-side concerns like batch querying, all sorts of things like that. But all in all, GraphQL is proving to be an extremely attractive option for building web APIs. It gives more power to clients, allowing them to ask for exactly the data that they need. It allows API designers to evolve APIs more organically over time. And it enables powerful developer tooling that has not yet been realized at this particular layer of the web stack. It's not a silver bullet, and you're going to run into problems that you didn't have to really think about before. But I do encourage you, whether you're a current or future engineering leader, to look deeply with your engineers and decide if GraphQL is the right tool for your job. So that is all I have. If you want to chat more, please see me at my office hours at 3.40, I think. And thanks so much for listening. Thank you.